In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. This event was held in Mitchell. I uh, am speaking about some soils topics around the state this year, and this is an abbreviated version of that because of time and and uh, the highlight of, of what I need to or want to share with you is basically all work that's been done on mostly on no-till and so um, but that's a bulk of what we do anymore I guess that's my interest as well and I'd first like to highlight the the rig here um, Al Miron's planting rig there you all know him very well from the commercials on TV uh, just a wonderful uh, set of commercials that uh, promote soil health and no-till and I, I think they've done a great job with that but to get started, I want to really look at the folks behind the scenes as well, uh, highlight them because uh, what I do is, is part of what they do. And, and so it's a team effort. Sarah Berg on the left, she's going to start with extension here this summer. Work, she's working with Dr. Sexton right now in her master's. And we really are, are eager to get her on board with extension. And she's also very uh, related. She has a farm by Baltic. So She's real, you know, well into it as well. Uh, and then Ruth Beck, uh, colleague in, in Peer, um, really enjoy working with her. And I've got a couple of her research projects here in the data set. David Karkey in the middle there from Watertown. I've uh, been working on cover crop research with him and some soil fertility stuff. And then I have a plant pathologist up here, Connie Strunk from Sioux Falls. And uh, she and I got a grant from the Soybean Research and Promotion Council to do a lot of this work, the soybean work. And so that's why she's up here. And then Dr. Sexton, a manager at Southeast Farm, do a lot of work, work down there at the Southeast Farm. And then I'd like to bring highlight to our sponsors, of course, the Soybean Board, uh, Dow, West Central, Coke Fertilizer, and then the Southeast and Northeast Research Farms. Um, this data I showed you last year, this is the, uh, the nitrogen calibration work that, that Ron Gelderman started uh, in 2013. It was carried on in 2014 after he left. Just as a little review, uh, our current recommendations are at 1.2 pounds of N per corn uh, yield goal. And uh, it looks like uh, if we can get a chance to kind of summarize this data and, and publish it, that maybe those recommendations would be changing to one. One pound of N per corn uh, on the yield goal there. And, and this is our N rate calculator for corn. Uh, if we go to that one versus 1 1.2 on a 200 bushel yield goal, that's about 40 pounds or at 38 cents, about $15 an acre. So uh, something to really consider there as well. The reason I uh, reviewed this is, is I'm kind of sharing that information, getting folks used to that because there's some regulatory uh, reasons to, to kind of get, get folks used to the one as a coefficient and so we're just kind of spreading the word a little bit but officially SDSU recommendations have not been changed from 1.2 to 1 but uh, I think the evidence is strong that that can be done. Anthony, yes? A question, uh, what do you do about the soil test nitrate if you don't have a deep sample? Well, in the, the, the program we used to use at the lab would, would estimate an average and I can't uh, we don't have the lab on campus anymore, so I can't speak for what other labs do. But uh, if you use a 20 to 25 pounds and that's 6 to 24, that's pretty, pretty close to an average. But that's, that's what the lab would do if they didn't have that deep test. Um, the reason I highlight this slide is we had some data uh, from back in the 90s that uh, would show that we needed an extra 30 pounds for, for what we would consider no, new no-till fields there. Uh, that are building carbon, building organic matter. We need to build the nitrogen in the soil as well. This is the yield response curves, and we can easily tell that the optimum nitrogen rate for no-till and, and conventional till were different at that time, about that 30 pounds difference. So that's where that came from, is a number of studies that we had that uh, did that. But this is about six-year no-till, young no-till. Uh, got that organic matter increasing rapidly. Uh, Sarah Berg, who I mentioned uh, uh, going to be joining Extension, is working on her thesis with Dr. Sexton. They have a 24-year tillage comparison at the Southeast Farm. And uh, basically what they're finding is there's a lot of curves here, but the optimum end rate is pretty much uh, the same. 
So uh, I guess at some point uh, in, in longer term no-till fields, we can, we can maybe take away that extra end that may be required. Uh, what do we do in the interim between shorter term no-till and longer term, this 24-year no-till? That, that's, uh, that's a good guess. It's probably somewhere in between. Uh, Duane would say we can manage that with cover crops and rotations, and, and that, that, that's true. But uh, this is the corn soybean uh, rotation here in no-till. So it looks promising that possibly that uh, those end rates will be, will be the same. Wanted to highlight some work that we did do at Al Miron's farm. Uh, he likes to do field scale work, which is great. Uh, uh, this study done on about a 65 acre field. Uh, we were looking at uh, side dress nitrogen basically here in this treatment here. So we had a low end rate at about 140 uh, pounds of N per acre all pl applied pre. Uh, the side dress had that 140 pre plus 50 at V6 knifed in as a liquid. And then uh, the high end rate would be the 190 that was all put down pre. We took some ear leaf samples, couldn't find any difference there in the uh, nitrogen in the leaf. Uh, did some stock testing there at the end of the season at physiological maturity. And then uh, basically no difference in yield. So what do you, th why don't, what was the reason we didn't get any response between these treatments? Anybody have a, have a thought there? Organic matter. Anybody else? Moisture. Moisture. Maybe the end rate was too high. Exactly. Yeah, we had, we had 54 pounds in the soil. So if our end rate was too high to begin with, we, we didn't have any sensitivity in our measurements. So we're going to try this again next year with a little bit lower uh, end rates and see if we can pick up some benefit from applying side dress nitrogen. Um, a couple other studies I want to highlight. This one on corn, we did uh, with some micronutrient work, boron, copper, manganese. Uh, we were really interested in the boron and the manganese because of some things going on in the industry. So we just threw copper in as well. Had five sites here, you can see across the top. Uh, the yields, uh, a variety of uh, uh, yields, a little lower here at the Northeast Farm, but all, all no-till sites. Uh, basically, the take-home message, no significant yield increase to those nutrients. And at every one of those sites, the university recommendations would have been zero for those nutrients. Same thing on soybeans, uh, five different sites. Again, the short of the long of it is no significant difference in those yields as well. And so uh, we do this once in a while to really confirm if our, new, our recommendations are, are still valid or if something has changed and we need to learn something new. Uh, a couple studies that Ruth Beck did out in Hughes County on soybeans, a starter fertilizer inoculant study, a control. Uh, soybeans with granular inoculant, uh, pre-inoculated seed, and then that pre-inoculated seed with starter. 60 pounds of MAP at planting in a corn soybean rotation, uh, irrigated. Uh, what's the take home message there? No significant difference in those yields as well. In another study, she did some late season end work on that, uh, another pivot. Uh, applied at R3 uh, nitrogen, 30 pounds of N is UAN. They're applied through the pivot, uh, no one yes, with and without N, no difference in the leaf tissue, and uh, no difference statistically in the yields, but uh, numerically maybe slightly higher uh, with that nitrogen applied at V3 stage. A um, lot of interest in cover crops and, uh, and, and the amount of nutrients contained in those crops. Uh, Jim Miller, uh, a crop consultant from Redfield Precision Soil Management, uh, had a huge interest as well and actually got the work done, uh, something that uh, we have been unable to do, but had several fields uh, with different mixes of cover crops in there, mostly after wheat, some hailed soybeans and, and a corn silage in there. And you can see the difference in the amount of nitrogen that was taken up by those cover crops. Uh, but what I did is I calculated um, or maybe Jim did this, but I, I did a little calculation on one of these numbers, but Basically, large amounts of nitrogen that these cover crops are, I call them sequestering, or converting to the, from the inorganic form to the organic form. And so anytime we do that, we, we 
catch and release, as Duane would say. And so these cover crops are catch and releasing these nutrients. So it, it really depends on the amount of dry matter that you've accumulated and the species of the cover crop. And I'll, uh, for the essence of time, I'll keep going. He also measured carbon and nitrogen in those and, we, and determined the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And the take home message is the more broad leaves, the radishes, the brassicas, the legumes, the lower the carbon to nitrogen ratio. The more grasses in the mix, the higher the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So using this type of information, you can manage for what you want to do. And I believe the Haney test and, and all that's getting at whether you need a high carbon cover crop or a high nitrogen cover crop. This is kind of where this is coming from. So my proposal is let's start managing that carbon to nitrogen ratio and let's forget about the cation exchange capacity. We hear so much about the cation. <laughs> I got a rise out of Dr. Ward. He knows what I'm talking about. So, so basically, the take-home message is let's, let's, let's hone in on the biology. Let's, let's think about what we're doing with our cover crops. Consider the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And I think we're going to be in a good, good point. So the ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil is about 24 to 1. I read that 16 parts of that carbon is for energy and 8 parts for maintenance. So if you add back wheat and corn, which are high carbon residues, you're probably not going to have enough N and those microbes will immobilize that N. But you've got a high carbon source there. If you want some nitrogen released, vetch and alfalfa will look like those are the ones that can do that. And I just have those as simple examples. So there's my contact information. I want to end with a little bit of fun. And I'm going to hopefully try to do that here. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Sexton on some cover crops and, 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 and Duane as well. Um, we're looking for something that's, as Pete would say, bulletproof. Oh, criminy. Okay, got it. Control. Control. This is uh, one of those things that, that Pete has determined is somewhat bulletproof. I don't have the audio, sorry to say. I should have it to get the effect, but what's going on here is we have an airplane that's uh, seeding a cereal rye into corn. This is on September 19th on, on my farm. If you look really close, you can see that rye. There it went, just hit. It doesn't hurt you. I was standing right out there and it, it just comes raining down and, and it's just fine. Here's another shot of that airplane coming, I think. Sure wished I had the, the volume because it was a lot of fun to hear the plane go roaring over top. But anyway, there's the effect of the video. I've got uh, some pictures of what that cover crop would look like. There is um, on September 26th. So we spread that on the 19th. There's the 26th. There's a rye seed there laying on top of the soil surface. It sent a little uh, root in uh, into the soil and it's growing. Uh, this is poor no-till, isn't it? <laughs> no residue cover. Uh, I did this in this part of the field. It's a gateway into the field where it's hard to keep the residue cover. But I wanted to show that seed growing on the surface. So that's uh, September 26th. Here's September 26th also out in the field where there's some residue. You can see those young rye plants coming up. Here it is on October 2nd. Got a lot more growth. That, that corn is, uh, is matured. It's dying down. There's light coming into the canopy. And that rye is doing quite well. And here we are on October 15th. A little bit harder to see, but uh, basically it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's stooling out or it's tillering a little bit, wanting to develop some roots, and, but a lot more light in that canopy at that point. And then uh, right at harvest on October 22nd, um, you can see that uh, we've got, we got some more leaves and stalks laying there. We had a big windstorm, but uh, you can see that the growth looks really well. Um, this is one of our attempts in corn and soybean country to introduce a crop, cover crop into that rotation. And if you're in wheat country, rise a swear word. I understand that. I was told that several times. But just wanted to show you uh, some of the things that we're trying to do in the east to get cover crops going. So Pete?
Let's see. Uh, let's take a couple of questions for Anthony as long as he's mic'd up. So. Sure. That was kind of quick, but we got to get to Pete and Dwayne. So. Um, actually, uh, uh, I had a, a person that uh, hauled a lot of manure and really beat it up a lot of really bad, and it came back not too bad. That's just an anecdotal evidence. Um, I took that picture right before I went through with the combine. And my combine goes through, and then those rye plants are covered with, with husk and thing. You kind of wonder what's going to happen, right? Um, maybe Pete has more experience there, but it seems to come out of it quite well and start growing in the spring. The big, the big key is what do you do to the soil if you don't have the rye roots there? That's a question. should have been asked. I think Brian has a question. Okay. Did you see a brassica there, Dan? No, I didn't. No, I intended to just do rye, 40 pounds an acre. I went out and checked, and I had some brassicas. And so I called my agronomist that I ordered from and said, hey, uh, did we miscommunicate? He said, no. Um, blankety blank seed tender that we used to get your rye to the airport had some other cover crop seed left in it. So I got, I got some brassicas for free. But just rye, 40 pounds an acre. Okay, we're gonna do a little. Yeah. Oh, he's okay. We're gonna do a little light switch here, so bear with us. Um, I got a question for you guys. Does anyone know if you increase your soil organic matter by one percent? How much extra water can hold? Okay, just a couple things to get started here. Uh, I need to give some credit where credit is due. Dwayne is the first guy to talk to me about putting winter rye into corn, probably seven years ago. I, I had the good fortune to go visit there right away when I hired on. Uh, and that stuck with me and we picked up a grant from the Sun Grant. And we tried winter rye over several years. Uh, um, both flying it on and drilling it. And again, if you're raising winter wheat, just close your ears. But if you're in a corn soybean system, you can listen. So uh, basically, as far as being bulletproof, what we found was if we put it on in the fall, if we had a dry fall and it didn't take and you think you had nothing there, it would come in the spring. So even if you don't get a stand in the fall, you would get a stand in the spring. And other things we tried would tend to either just sprout and die, winter kill, or not come up at all in the spring. So that's how the rye is kind of a low risk cover crop. And then the question about the traffic, I think, just think of a small grain with sprayer traffic. You're out there before it really starts to joint. If you were putting an herbicide down early, you really don't see that much damage and, and you have the benefits as Dwayne said. Okay, with this, um, uh, I'm going to talk first just on some soil temperature data that Anthony said I should share and then I'm going to talk about some cover crop work we've been doing the last few years at the southeast farm and we've also started doing some grazing and I need to acknowledge Warren Rushi and Elaine Grings as people working with us on the livestock side of it and I also need to acknowledge uh, Sand County Foundation has given the southeast board some support to uh, for instrumentation for monitoring soil, moisture, and temperature. And uh, NRCS has given us support to help uh, look at grazing cover crops. So I need to, we're getting help from different places, and I have to say thank you for that. Okay, so all that said, we'll start with the soil temperature data. Um, this is uh, looking at no-till versus tilled in a long-term rotation study. It's on soybean stubble. 
and this is in May, and we're looking at a diurnal temperature shift, and we see the, at the, uh, the warmer part of the day, the conventional till is a little warmer than the no-till. This is in June, so again, just looking at three days, and they're coming a little closer. Uh, we get into July, and we have canopy closure, and they're about the same. Actually, the no-till this year measured just a little bit warmer at the peak of the day in July and August. So we start out a little cooler, and then once the canopy closes, it's the same. And I have to say, this year, uh, we had very well-timed rain. We had a, about seven inches extra moisture that we usually don't get, and it was fairly well spread out in July and August. In a dry year, I think we would see the conventional till would be warmer in August, which would be detrimental. But in this particular year, we didn't see any difference. If we look at it across the season, these are hourly temperature measurements. And uh, here in May and June, we're a little cooler in the no-till. We came about 1.6 degrees cooler uh, um, for the first 35 days, or 1.8, I should say, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit cooler. And then once we had canopy closure, it leveled off. And I figure your growing points down below the ground about 30, 35 days. So maybe we lost somewhere on the order of 60 to 70 growing degree days. So maybe two, three days relative maturity difference, not too much. And then we're a little, actually a little warmer here, and I'm not sure if that's just experimental error or it could be we've got a little more microbial activity going on. Because in the tillage system, we're tilling our residue in out here. It's getting all burned up uh, really before the crop needs it uh, towards the minerals and nutrients being released. Whereas in the no-till system, the residue is breaking down throughout the year, and we would get more mineralization uh, when the crop needs it, when it's filling uh, grain the next July and August. So anyway, in this study, it was just a tad warmer, and I think maybe we had a little more activity, but that's just speculation on my part. So there's the soil temperature data there. Uh, we'll go into the cover crop study. We had two blends. Uh, we had a blend that was uh, uh, mostly uh, broad leaves, mostly cool season, uh, turnips, radish, peas, lentils, 75% of that. And then we had another contrasting blend with 75% grasses, so oats, barley, uh, millet, and sorghum sudan. And there's the blends there. And then we put cattle out there, and we looked at the rate of gain in the cattle on each of these two blends, and we came back and looked at the corn yields the next year with and without nitrogen. So there's the soil temperatures uh, in our uh, um, three treatments. So the control is no cover crop and no grazing. And we can see we had the least residue there. So we had the most oscillation in temperature, colder at night, warmer in the day. The grazed was kind of in between. And the ungrazed had the most residue. So it had uh, more damper swings in temperature. So not as cold at night, not as warm during the day. And if I look through the season, again, once the canopy closes, you didn't have any difference. This is control minus the grazed. And we're about one degree Fahrenheit warmer in the control. And then this is grazed versus ungrazed. And we're about one degree Fahrenheit warmer where it was grazed versus where it wasn't. If we look at the, take a step back and look at the uh, uh, performance of the cattle, uh, we had, we got saddled with some rodeo calves. So it was uh, my crew uh, didn't have a lot of fun trying to keep them where they were supposed to be, and they moved around a bit. <laughs> so the data is a little noisy. It's called re the basin. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's called we'll never do that again. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, so here's the average daily gains we got. And I just, just by a little bit of background, we were on rye and oats double. OK, the rye had very few volunteers. The oats had a lot of volunteers because we're getting paid better for a better test weight. So we tend to turn the air up a little bit. So we got a whole slew of volunteer oats where we're following oats. And then we have plus minus our, you know, our broadleaf mix and our grass mix. 
So if we look at the rye, very few volunteers, broadleaf cover crop mix, it's 31% grass. So we came pretty close to our target was to be 25% grass. We were 31% grass. They're the same cover crop mixture, but we're on oat stubble, so we have oat volunteers, it's 81% grass. Then the rye with the grass cover crops, 83%. Our target was 75 in this case, so we're close without the volunteers. And then the oats, so we got a lot of volunteers, plus a grass cover crop is 96% grass. And if we look at the cattle average daily rate of gain, it's about uh, 1.6 or 1.7 pounds per head per day with the mostly broadleaf mix. And as we get more grasses, we come up here uh, about 2.6 pounds per head per day with mostly <coughs> grasses in the mix. And again, because of the noise, it's, it's not statistically significant, but you can see the trend there that the Blend, the cover crop blends that had more grasses in tended to give us a little better uh, rate of growth on the cattle. And the people I was working with in animal science weren't really surprised at that. They said basically the brassicas are very digestible. If you send them into a lab for analysis, they come back very high for digestibility and protein, but they're very high moisture. And they think the high moisture content limits the intake. So uh, not to say anything, you know, the brassicas are good feed, but if your na name of the game is to get more uh, cattle production, you want to have more grasses in the mix. Or provide some grass hay maybe. Okay, so we'll go from there and look at impacts on uh, uh, corn yield the next year. So I broke this out we ha by main, what we call main effects. So we have every combination of plus minus grazing, plus minus uh, broadleaf or grass cover crop, and plus minus nitrogen. So we have each combination of that. And just breaking it out by the main effects, just comparing the broadleaf to the grass cover crops across all the nitrogen and grazing treatments. The broadleaf uh, cover crop gave us about 15 bushel per acre better corn yield the next year than did the grass-based <coughs> cover crop. If we compare the grays to the not grays, this difference is about 179 versus 175, and it was non-significant. So we didn't really see a significant effect of grazing, and there was a slight maybe uh, benefit to it. But uh, anyway, four bushel per acre there, but it's not statistically significant. So at least we can say the grazing didn't hurt anything. And then if we look at plus minus nitrogen, the difference here is about uh, 50 bushel per acre. Now if I break this out into individual treatments, so each of these bars, this first bar is no, cover, no grazing and no cover crop. The red bar is full graze. The green bar is partial, uh, uh, no grazing. And the yellow bar is partial grazing, but we had a lot of hard trouble managing for that partial grazing. So basically we want to focus on this red and green bars. And down here, this first group is no nitrogen with a broadleaf cover crop mix, no nitrogen with the grass, and then broadleaf with nitrogen, grass with nitrogen. And uh, these statistically are all the same. There's no significant effect there. So with the broadleaf cover crop, it didn't matter whether we grazed or not. If we look at the grass cover crop, this is statistically significant here. So where we had a... Uh, 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 grazed cover crop, um, we didn't see any drop in yield. Where we didn't graze and we had a heavy grass cover crop, we dropped the yield significantly, about uh, close to 30 bushel here, about 25 bushel. So grazing significantly benefited a heavy grass cover crop mix. And then when we add nitrogen, we basically lose those effects. Although the, the broadleaf cover crop still did a little better than the grass with nitrogen, but basically nitrogen evens it all out. So that last data I showed you was from small plots or 50 by 50 foot plots where we had exclusion fence out. Then we had some large plots that are about a quarter of an acre in size. Or, uh, and so this is a plot yields from those plots. So these are all grazed. So th there's zero nitrogen, 160 and broadleaf versus grass. And the plots, the yield area is 12 rows by about 400 feet. And uh, there's a significant nitrogen effect. Again, it's about 60 bushel per acre. 
Uh, and then the broadleaves yielded about 15 bushel per acre better than the grass. That wasn't quite statistically significant. The chance there is about one out of five that it's due to random events. But we see that there was a significant increase in seed size between broadleaf cover crop and grass. So I think this yield effect is, is real. Okay, so moving away from grazing, uh, we have some work where we compare a number of different cover crops, and we've been doing this in different form or fashion for several years. Um, and we have a hairy vetch blend where we're, we're looking to get the hairy vetch to overwinter and put on growth in the spring, but I haven't succeeded yet. It's winter killed every time we've tried it. Then I have a low residue and a high residue blend, which is basically the same as what we looked at the other one. This is 75% cool season broadleaves, and this is 75% grasses. And then I have a broadleaf blend that, again, is mostly uh, cool season broadleaves. And looking at uh, Duff the following year, I have my grass-based blend versus a broadleaf-based blend. And this is late June, so this is like June 28th. And we have about 20% uh, uh, more uh, residue on the field at the end of June where we have a grass-based cover crop than we do with a broadleaf-based cover crop. And if I, we didn't have time, but if we'd taken this measurement in May, the difference would have been even greater because they're all going to zero. You know, if you go out there in the fall, you can't see any difference. So these grass-based systems, again, as An Anthony said, you know, higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, I like to think of it in terms of fiber. The more fiber you have, the longer it's going to last. So if you want residue because you're trying to save moisture, this is a good thing. If you're in a situation where you think it's too wet, and you'd like to open it up more, then you want to go with a more broadleaf base. Okay, this is the temperature difference, broadleaf versus grass. And they're pretty similar, but if you average this out, it's about 0.6 degrees cooler under the grass treatment. Again, I think it's just a function of more residue. Okay, this is the response of each of those to nitrogen. And uh, um, so I have two controls. So this treatment had a double set of controls. And we have 0, 40, 80, 120, 160, 200 pounds of nitrogen. And they really fall along similar lines. It looks like we get some separation up here with the uh, 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 broadleaf blends tending to yield a little better. So I asked my technician, Sarah Berg, to uh, run a linear plateau analysis on it so the computer could do its thing and it wouldn't just be what I thought. And this is what the computer came up with as a best fit. And the controls and the grass-based blend uh, come in about 12 bushel per acre less than what we see with the broadleaf-based blend. And that's pretty consistent with what we see other years. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is that at least with these blends that we're looking at, we really don't see where it's sparing any nitrogen. If we had, if our broadleaf blend was really giving us more nitrogen, I, you know, we'd end up with some points out here where you know, the, in the control where we didn't fertilize, we'd see the broadleaf blend would be up here because it provided more nitrogen. But they're all fall along that line. So, uh, and we're not, you know, we're only about 20, 25% legumes and, and probably about 50% brassicas. So maybe if we had more legumes, that would change it. But basically, with, with what we've got, we don't see an effect where we're saving nitrogen. We do see a yield effect, but we don't see it where it spares nitrogen. Okay, so we've done something along these lines for several years. And so I, just by way of summary, I thought I'd pull those together. So in 2012, we had a uh, uh, very dry year. Our yields in the trial were around 30 bushel per acre. We just got hammered. Um, and I remember talking to my board then, and I said, guys, this is the driest year I have ever remember. And they were older than me, and they said, yeah, this is the driest year we remember too. So I didn't feel quite so bad. So anyhow, we got 30 bushel per acre that year in 2012. But even when that dry, dry year, we picked up 11 bushel per acre uh, yield gain with the cover crop, uh, broadleaf-based cover crop. So this is comparing the broadleaf-based cover crop to control, no cover crop. So drought year, 11 bushel per acre gain, and that was significant at 10% level. 2014, we picked up 7 bushel per acre, 
This year, the same trial, we picked up 12 bushel per acre. And then uh, if I pull in the grazing plots, so this is grazing with the large plots, we get 15 bushel per acre with the cool season, uh, in this case versus a grass cover crop. But the grass usually behaves like a control. And this is grazing with small plots. We pick up 14 bushel per acre. Uh, comparing the cool season broadleaf to no cover crop. So if you average all that out, it's 11 bushel per acre. So uh, these aren't all statistically significant, but you can see the trend there. And I pooled the data from 2014 and 2015 because these years were pretty similar. And uh, if I put those two years together and run the statistical analysis on it, it comes out the average is about 10 bushel per acre yield gain with a cool season broadleaf cover crop versus no cover crop. And that's significant at a 0.06 level, which is uh, your chances are uh, uh, between one out of, anyway, your chances are over 90%. It's a real effect. So there's some variability there, but I think we can say on average at the Southeast farm anyway, we're picking up around 10 bushel an acre benefit with these cool season broadleaves. Now, if you're in a really dry area, that may not be what you want. So I just have to put that caveat on there. This is at Beersford. Um, in another place with less rainfall, you might want a different cover crop mix. And we talked about that. So uh, I'll just go through the summary really quick. Uh, First, the trend for cattle to gain weight faster with a greater proportion of grass in the cover crop blend. Uh, soil temperatures were intermediate with the grazed and control because the, the residue levels were intermediate. And then where adequate nitrogen was providing, grazing really didn't affect the yield of the next crop. Where we didn't fertilize, the grass-based cover, cover crop blend benefited from grazing. And uh, corn following a broadleaf blend tended to yield better than following a grass-based blend. I said this is, the grass-based blends in our work comes out real similar to control, meaning no cover crop, unless you graze it. And the difference here is, as I just said before, is around the order of 10 bushel per acre on average. Okay, treatments with less residue tend to have one to two degree Fahrenheit uh, uh, greater temperature during mid-May to mid-June. And I figure that's, you're looking at 35 to 70 growing degree days. Once you get past, uh, you know, mid-June, your growing point's up above ground for the corn crop and you're running on air temperature rather than soil temperature. And we haven't seen an effect of the cover crop on nitrogen fertilizer requirements. And we've done the nitrogen response work in 2012, we had data, 2014 and 2015. And we haven't seen a real effect uh, where we spared nitrogen in any of those cases. We didn't get any cover crops in 2013 because they wouldn't grow in the drought of 2012. I mean, we, didn't, we don't have data from 2013 because we didn't have any cover crop growth in 2012. All right. This season had almost ideal rainfall during seed filling. And it's kind of what I said, tried to allude to earlier in a drier environment. Uh, we might see a yield response to having more residue on the surface. So just this data is from Beersford, so just keep that in mind as you interpret it. Okay, with that, I think I better pass the mic over to Dwayne.
find more peas and lentils in the neck if you were if you wanted to increase the uh, nitrogen rate. But uh, it kind of depends on your system there. If you've got nitrate in the ground left over from your small grain, those legumes are going to take nitrate up before they pick in. Um, and I, so, I, but I would say. Uh, I would say if, if you want to push push your nitrogen, put more legumes in the mix, and particularly ones that are going to withstand a frost. Right, so like cow peas, as soon as you get a frost, they're toast. So you're looking at lentils and peas, and uh, uh, fava beans. You could try, but fava beans are really big seed size. I think that'd be expensive. Um, I don't, Dwayne. Anything else comes to mind there? Well, the, for legumes, fall legume type things. Uh, well, and that's where the hairy vetch or something can, and the clovers will keep going into fall. Um, chickling vetch will go fairly late into fall, but cow peas they go back to they go back to Kansas as soon as it gets to about thirty-seven degrees. It doesn't have to freeze. It. Yeah, they go further than Kansas. <laughs> okay, with that we're going to turn over to Dr. Dwayne Beck. Uh, Really needs no introduction. He's been the manager of the SPSU Dakota Lakes Research Station near Pierre since uh, probably the glacier receded. You took over. Uh, 17,000 17, <laughs> 17, years ago. Um, this is our our lateral move systems with with Jorgensen's cows, um, and you can see the buckets hanging down. Those we had ropes hanging down that held the wires. Uh, there's posts on those and then the buckets and that's that was the wire so when we moved it we just turned it on to move and the cows come running and then they're eating the swath swath gray stuff so that's kind of interesting we're, we're trying to build this self-propelled grazing cell I was told that we're supposed to talk about new things so that's that's one of our new things um, that one <clears throat> that one cow weighed 1944 pounds uh, so they weren't like small cows. They were big cows um, or small elephants. I was trying to decide that, Brian, when they showed up and they come out of that truck. What the hell is this? But So we're going to try to go through this. We had a lot of talk about weed control. Uh, you know, we've been no-tilling forever. And, and one of the first weeds that got us was mare's tail. But it grows in the fall, that fall 2,4-D roundup thing. Just wax it right out of it. We had one called uh, yellow goat's beard or meadow salsify does the same thing. And the and the thing is, you got a problem. You provide the opportunity. And there's a lot of research, and I think I've got some. I don't didn't put all of it on your your sheet, but you can look at Randy Anderson stuff. Tillage is not a solution. It makes the weed control problem worse because it randomizes the seed bank. So you're better off. With, with diverse rotations and, 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 and not disturbing the seed zone. And I got all kinds of data. So if you want to argue about that, come talk to me. I got it on the computer and I'll show it to you. But we're going to have to have dinner sometime. Uh, but remember, Mother Nature is an opportunist. So if you got a problem, you provide it the opportunity. And if tillage was good as getting rid of weeds in eastern South Dakota, the son of bitches would all be gone. <laughs> so. <clears throat> This is that first one that happened, and we actually intentionally caused kochia to become ALS resistant because I was under threat of lawsuit for saying that was going to happen. And so we made it happen, and then the lawsuit was dropped. Okay, kind of like a Donald Trump thing. Um, I don't know what's going on there. But we now use pursuit because we can take that back out of there. And there is some resistant weeds yet, but we got, we got them down to a low enough population, they're not a, they're not a problem. You know, and, and um, there's always been weeds that are resistant to, to Roundup. When you started, there's resistant ones, okay? And, and, and some of them, you just, like he said this morning, you set the jug on them. But you just don't let them become a problem, okay? That's really, so <clears throat> if, if you're, you're looking at resistant weeds rotations, here's water, hemp, 10, and 100. Um, <clears throat> if you do a rotation that's one year out, corn, soybean, for instance, if you're, you're 
controlling it in the corn year, not the soybean year or something, 10 of them turned to 10 million in seven years. Okay, if you have a more diverse rotation where you're doing, controlling them two years out of three, like putting the weed in there, like was asked about, they don't blow up for a long time, like over 17 years. If you do what guys are doing, Roundup every year in the corn soybean, corn soybean is not a rotation, it's a two crop monoculture. Okay, so if you're using Roundup on both sides and whatever, the same chemistry, it blows up in about four or five years. And so yeah, we're going to have that problem unless you stop doing what you're doing. And, and, and here's the other ways to handle it, more diverse rotations. Uh, two in and one out is this guy right here, so corn, corn, bean. If, if you're going to do something, that makes more sense. Okay. <clears throat> uh, natural control benefits, two years out, if you're doing wheat or something like that, and you get two years out, you get 95% control. Now just, same thing happens with uh, uh, warm season weeds and cool season crops. You got to change that crop. Uh, foxtail, for instance, or water hemp, if you want to, it gets in sync with the corn soybean rotation, but not with the wheat rotation because the wheat's harvested before water hemp. It's up there, it's competitive. The water hemp won't grow, and if it does grow, you can kill it uh, once the wheat's harvested. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a rotation study we did. I guess thing, this thing doesn't really show up on there. But this is a rotation that we did, rotation study we did for 12 years. And Randy Anderson came out and counted the weeds after 12 years. We put on no herbicides. And he came out, this is a half section of ground with, with a, a 15 different rotations. And he came out in those plots and counted the weeds in, in the plots that 12th year where we put no herbicides in and counted in the wheat plots where we did a rotation that's two cool season crops, wheat, wheat chickpea like corn soybean, he had 94, where we had wheat corn chickpea, he had 40, and where we did this more diverse rotation, he had seven, and that's with no herbicides. Okay, he did the same thing where Claire Stimus did a study out West River that was tilled. <clears throat> Once every time he needed to use anhydrous, he used anhydrous. So it's just during his wheat year or his corn year, he would, he would use anhydrous. And, and that's all he did for, for uh, disturbance. So he counted the weeds in, in, in Claire's plot. And where Claire had a similar type rotation, he had 225 versus totally no disturbance, 94, 44 versus 7, where he had a more diverse rotation. And then the, 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 the point is if you're doing tillage, you have more problems controlling weeds than where you're doing a true no till thing. 225 weeds with poor rotation and like corn, soybean, and disturbance versus seven, where you have good rotation and no disturbance. So <clears throat> Randy got intrigued by this, so he did a study on our farm where he, he buried uh, green fox till two, four, two, uh, zero, two and four inches deep, me measured the number of live seeds yearly by just coming out and pulling out the ones that grew and then letting other ones grow, and we put no herbicides on it. Uh, <clears throat> After two years, where he left them on the service, he only had 11 left. Where he buried them two inches deep, he had 28. Where he buried them four inches deep, he had 55. The same thing happens with white mold. If anybody tells you to do tillage to get rid of white mold, tell them to look at the literature. They're totally wrong. 2003, we did a whole thing in Sioux Falls where we brought in Greg Grau's graduate student that showed that. Best thing you can do to get rid of white mold is grow a cover crop to fool it and make it go early and make it go in a year when you don't have something. Okay, <clears throat> and then he did a thing where he come out and we just let the weeds that we had go to seed once, everything that was there, to four, four different sites on the farm. And then, <clears throat> and then he took a little tiller and tilled them in one to three inches deep versus leaving them undisturbed. And then he counted seedlings for three years. Okay, same thing. 100% were the number of weeds that grew first year where there was tillage. And then he just compared everything to that. 88% where we did no till, left them on the surface. First year, second year, 48 versus 32. You got to have that longer break to get that third year in there. 
get out to the third year. You get two years in between when you use that susceptible thing. You can think of these as being resistant weeds, so to speak, because we weren't using herbicides on them. And we're down to four. So we get 96% weed control after a two-year break. So if you're doing corn, pea, winter wheat, corn, you get <coughs> weeds that go to, that you miss in corn, the resistant weeds. If you get them in the peas and the winter wheat and you come back to corn again, you only have 4% left if you haven't disturbed. If you disturbed, you have 33% of them left. That's what that's telling you. But if you're doing <coughs> corn bean corn or corn pea corn, you got 48% of them left with tillage and 32. It doesn't make any difference. Neither one of those is acceptable. Okay? So, <laughs> this is when we used to have our auto steer. Auto steer better than that, right? Anyway, that's my weed control stuff that I <laughs> really wasn't intended to show you, but I guess I did. Uh, <clears throat> I'll show you a little, little cattle stuff and then we'll go eat lunch. Okay. Oh, that's Pete's. I know I have it. Here's my damn computer. I should be able to find it, right? There we go. I was going to show you a bunch of fertilizer stuff, too, and I can tell you what, that's all in your sheet, so we're going to leave that alone, maybe. Uh, the point is on fertilizer, Peter, are you using starters? Uh, we're, we're, we're no, nah, but not two, two by two by zero, right? You're not putting your fertilizer nitrogen two inches to the side of the row. No. Okay. Don't. <clears throat> if if. Well, if you're doing that, don't look at his responses to nitrogen, because it's worth twenty bushel the acre for us in no-till to put that nitrogen to the side band, and we can get by with lower rates. My opinion. Okay, soil health, that's what we're talking about today. That's Dan Forge's hands uh, and Mike Cronin's soil. So, and they're both here. <laughs> so, it, no till. First thing that pops up is you got to do no till. And I'm not sure why we don't understand that. If you disturb the soil, you can have a healthy soil. It just doesn't happen. Uh, Mother Nature doesn't do tillage. And then you need diversity. Diverse rotations plus cover crops. I don't think you can do it just with cover crops and not diverse rotations. You've got to have diversity, more diversity. And then I think we actually need livestock. And we get those three together. And we need the livestock because I think eventually we've got to quit exporting our nutrients to China. Somebody said, well, China is buying our Syngenta. Hell, China is buying your damn phosphorus. You know, a <coughs> railroad, a, a train load of Soybeans going out of here has over half a million pounds of phosphorus in it. They're buying your phosphorus. You don't think anything of that. I'd lot rather sell them Syngenta than sell our phosphorus. 200 years or 600 years, Syngenta won't even, won't even know that name. But if we sold our phosphorus, we sold our phosphorus. <clears throat> Healthy soil. We, we ran into this. I've shown you this before. This is Argentina years ago when they used to do seven years of farming and seven years of of, of pastures. And then they would come in with diverse rotations and cover crops. On the left, you see the hairy vetch cover crop. Of, uh, black oats and hairy vetch had been killed, and they're planting soybeans into it. That was mostly black oats, I think. But that's what the soil looked like. And if you want to know what a healthy soil is, that's what it looks like. If your soil doesn't look like that, then you don't really have a healthy soil. You know, you're, you're maybe getting there. But that's what it should look like. And that big earthworm hanging there. And, and then they outlawed the export of beef. And they outlawed the export of beef because they wanted the guys to quit doing cattle and start doing more soybeans so it was easier to tax them. Okay, that was what was going on. And that's been going on for a number of years. That's just ending now. You should be watching what's happening in Argentina because they've had a political change and they're going to go back to probably doing more cattle, which would be good for Argentina. You know, and it may, may cause some consternation here. But this particular field, that was taken in 1996, right after the glaciers left. And, <laughs> okay. And then, 
It is kind of interesting, though, because kids come from SDSU to the farm, and we've had rotations that have been going longer than they've been alive. And it, it always gets them when you remind them of that. They go, oh, and then they go, God, he must be older than my dad. <laughs> <laughs> But I went back to that same field in 2006, and after doing corn and soybeans, that's what it looked like. There's not enough carbon in corn and soybeans to have a healthy soil. You've got to add more carbon. And so we really try to get more high carbon type soils. Ruth and I went to France last February. A year ago this week, I was still in Ghana, but we'd been in February, in, 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 France before that, and they took us to see all their castles, and they'd show you the granaries in the castles, and they said, where did they grow the grain for these granaries? And they said, well, around the castle, and they said, well, that soil is so degraded it won't grow anything anymore. And then I reminded them that my ancestors and all your ancestors pretty much left Europe and came here looking for good soils to degrade because all the soils in Europe had been degraded already. Okay, so we just, we just don't have time to screw around, not get serious about starting to preserve things. This is what a soil looks like in France. <laughs> hey, you wait 100 years, ours is going to look just like that. I saw them coming in yesterday. Going to look just like that if we keep doing what we're doing. So, now, what are new things? Real fast, we've we got three projects going with the Buffett thing. One is to restore native vegetation as much as we can to roadsides and public lands. This is core land between us and the river that was crested wheatgrass, and we've now switched it to tall grass prairies at Pier, because that's what Lewis and Clark found when they came there. And if you don't recognize these guys, John Cooper is the guy with the cap on in the back, right? And he was head of game fishing parks, and I brought him out there and said, did you plant these? And he goes, no. And I said, well, we got them to come back. Okay? Clay seed balls. So one of the things we're doing is that roadside habitat thing. We put our ditch, our road ditch from broom grass to tall grass prairie. We should have told DOT before we did it. But <laughs> if you want to hear that telephone conversation, we can do that over lunch. Uh, <clears throat> we're doing something with seed ball technology, like Anthony and Pete talked about putting rye on, and sometimes it grows and sometimes it doesn't. We have to have a way to be able to put our cover crops on and get them started before we harvest our first crop and, and do that consistently. And it's going to come down to putting on some kind of seed coat. And this is some we had a German kid make. We've got we had about $100,000 worth of those seed balls made up last year, and we're going to be doing quite a bit of it this year to look at that as part of this Buffett, Buffett effort. Uh, here's some of the stuff that, that has been done this year, just preliminary stuff looking at in, in the greenhouse and in the field what happens when they go out. Here's some TAF with no coating and the 34%, 50%, 70%, that's how much coat we put on them. And you can see that it doesn't grow as well if you've got too much coat, which might be good if we want it to delay. And then the A means it's got an absorbent on it that helps subtract moisture, and that's, that appears to be helping us. And we've got some data, you know, both in the field and in the greenhouse, and, and the pluses and minuses tell us where it did good or bad. It was just kind of a good preliminary piece of work. Here's some stuff. We put flax out into sunflowers when the sunflowers were <clears throat> relatively small, but they were growing, and we have a lot of trouble out last even with no-till sunflowers and they come through in the spring and seed something into them, the dirt will try to blow because the sunflowers are just kind of Mickey Mouse. So <clears throat> we went out and we, you see these little flaxes growing. These were coated flax. The flax without coating didn't grow at all. So we're, we're kind of, you know, just at the very infancy of, of looking at that. Cover crops for grazing. Instead of letting your wheat straw sit here, we're going to put a high carbon cover crop because we need to get more carbon in the soils and build them. Uh, that hay millet thing like that, as it gets colder, it, it kind of quits growing like the cow peas and then the oats come up through it and then we'll swath this and we'll graze it, okay? 
We're doing a thing with alfalfa in a continuous cornfield. Cornfield has been corn for 25 years. We've got half of that where we've got alfalfa growing underneath, so it's a perennial cover crop. 20 inch rows, we can't really keep the alfalfa alive there, so what we did, we've got one of these fancy corn planter things. Uh, we're in 20 inch rows, so we, we, we got one row of corn, uh, a row of alfalfa, and then two rows of corn, a row of alfalfa, two rows of corn, a row of alfalfa all the way across. And then we go back and forth. We end up with a pattern like that. We planted, uh, you can notice, 38,000 seeds per acre in, in those these rows of corn, so it's, it, it's an equivalent of 38,000 if it was in 30 inch rows. I told it it was 30 inch rows. And, and then we put the alfalfa in between. So we're still at 38,000 net per acre. Now that's kind of interesting. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll see how that works when we get next year and the year after, but the alfalfa does better now. So we're still, in, think of it as being in 30 inch rows on 20 inch centers. Right? We still got a net 30 inch row there because it's two 20s and a 40 inch gap. So it's just let, giving a little chance for sunlight to get through. Here's one we do that's a little bit like Colin Sice does in, in Australia. He uses the tall grass prairie. This is switchgrass and he grows his cool season crops. This is peas and then he'll harvest the peas and then let the switchgrass come back and graze it. But we don't have time to harvest our peas for peas here. We don't have a long growing season he, he has. But this is going to be grazed uh, right at about this stage, right before the switchgrass starts to grow. We're going to run in there and do a high intensity grazing on it. And, and we didn't this year because we didn't have the cows yet, but that's what we're going to do this coming year. Come in, do a high intensity grazing, then let the switchgrass grow, and then harvest it for seed. Okay. Uh, again, there's some of our cover crop. This is that. Uh, this is a pickup, and then there are hay millet there, so it's pretty good size stuff. And then we swathed it. This is what it looked like before we swathed, grazed it. And then the cows. These are they're spreading out. They're eating these. We're moving here. We're manually moving the wire uh, about every two or three days. The thing that's interesting, the wire's right here. You can't really tell, but they clean it all up but they don't take any of their other residue off. It's kind of interesting how good a job they do of sorting it out. Uh, <clears throat> there's that irrigator you saw with buckets hanging down and the rope and then there's wire across here. And, and the bucket just gives you weight so the, so the, the wire doesn't get to blowing when it's windy. And, and, and then when it goes and hits, if the wire hits a corn sock or something, that bucket's just heavy enough to keep everything moving. It's very simple. <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure out how the hell we're gonna do that. We have all these complex things and I just went out put some buckets on there and said, let's try this. We thought we might have to put some water in the buckets, but didn't have to do that. So <clears throat> there's, there's the Jorgensen cows. And the interesting thing, and you saw this actually on the, on the video, is we had, this was corn stalks. There's two irrigators that ran side by side. And there, we had a wire ran all the way through. Two were tied together. They had to move at the same speed. But uh, when we moved them, we had to start one and run to the other end take the bike and go around the other end and start it so it'd go at the same speed. But this had corn stalks and then we had different things behind wheat in terms of cover crops. This, this was winter wheat and the other three were spring wheat. The place they went is where we had the winter wheat. So the first they ate that regrowth of the winter wheat and then they ate the, the swaths that were there and then they went and ate the other swaths and the last thing they went to was the corn stalks. It's kind of an interesting thing. And here's a thing that Ducks Unlimited did uh, where they, they flew on uh, some of it cereal rye, some of it coated, and some of it non-coated on a field they had, and that was actually flowing on after soybean harvest. <laughs>